The Culture Pop Podcast is brought to you by the law offices of Jacob and Ronnie. Accident. Boring to recall Jacob and Ronnie. Call Jacob. Hey, it's Mace. If you or a friend or loved one is injured in an accident, the first person you should call is my friend Jacob. When I did this, Jacob was great. He helped me by talking through the next steps, which really put my mind at ease. When you're injured in an accident, you got to have an expert. That's why you call Jacob, just like I did. Call Jacob, 844-24-JACOB. That's 844-24-JACOB. Or visit calljacob.com. Call Jacob. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Culture Pop Podcast. I'm Steve Mason, along with Sue Kalinske. Great guest today, Sue, Larry Kazanoff, who's a studio exec and producer of all kinds of movies. He's got a brand new book out called A Touch of the Madness, which um, I've I've had from time to time. Sue, you, you know all about madness. Oh, with you especially. <laughs> <laughs> there was a touch of it. Back well, in New York, there was a touch you, of the madness. That was a touch of the madness, as long along with a lot of other men in my life. Yes. Uh, well, I, I hopefully didn't jilt you like some of them. Well, you didn't jilt me in that way. Correct. Correct. Here we are 20 years later. So um, I, I wanted to point this out. So sometimes we do the beginning of the show, then the interview, and then the end, but we do them at different times. So when we get to Larry, you'll notice that our clothes... And even our address changes. So uh, we'll do the introduction for Larry. Then we'll go to the Larry. And uh, we're completely different in that. Uh, Because we did one the other day, an open. And I was like, I don't like that. You know how I am, Sue. I didn't like it. You're a perfectionist. I'm a perfectionist. And I want control over everything. And I acknowledge it. Um, Micromanager, all these things that I am. See, I'm owning it, though. You're learning. You're get you're you're getting better. Becoming self aware. What would be really really funny with the changes is if you actually had a mustache when we oh, that the actually would grow a beard. It would take me three months to grow a beard, and there still wouldn't be anything there. But you're right. <laughs> it would be very funny. It would be very funny. So you were asking me when we did this the first time. John Ireland and I went to Craig's restaurant. Have you ever heard of Craig's? No, I have never heard of Craig's. So it's like a fancy West Hollywood celebrities go there kind of thing. And so I went there exclusively for the celebrities. I got the chicken parm, which was fantastic and worth the the, uh, trip. But I was looking for celebrities. So uh, we go there and it's me and Juan and John and his wife, Lisa. I want to ask you a question. What's more important, the food or seeing celebrities? Oh, that's so close. I think seeing celebrities. Really? Yeah, yeah. You mean if you had a crappy meal, it would be worth well, seeing a celebrity? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. that It's one of the, I'm not there for the food. I didn't go out of my way because I heard Craig's was delicious, right? I went out of my way because TMZ cameras are always outside and there are famous people going in. So that's, that's why I went. Now, the food did turn out to be delicious. I had the best chicken parm I've had in a very, very long time. So it was worth it. But the big deal was... Uh, John Ireland's all-time favorite, the the woman that he says he would leave Lisa for, Kate Beckinsale, was in the restaurant. He would leave her for Kate Beckinsale? Well, I mean, he loves Kate Beckinsale. I don't think he would actually leave her. But he says wow, Kate Beckinsale is his dream girl. Really? Yeah, dream girl. Dream girl. Uh, but what's weird about this is that this is the first time Juan and me and Lisa and John Ireland have been out on a double date together. In 30 years, it has never happened, whether as Juan or before, has never happened before. And I find that so crazy, ridiculous, that you've never socialized like that. Now, we I've been to parties at his house. He's been to parties at my house. So we have socialized. He and I do stuff all the time. It's just rarely with the, the spouses. Um, but we have a unique relationship. I mean... We're friends, um, but we run in such different circles that we don't, uh, and the circles don't overlap very often. Um, so parties, yes. Dinners, probably not. I don't go to Manhattan Beach very much, and he doesn't leave Manhattan Beach very much. 
So I've not been to any of the restaurants down there, but I will do it again. It was a very nice time. They're very busy people. John, of course, is getting ready for Lakers season. Lisa is like all over it at this tennis club. And I heard many, many stories about it. Uh, but uh, but we'll we'll socialize again. It's weird when we're doing the show. This will surprise people, I think. We rarely talk when we go to commercial breaks because we don't want to spoil the show, right? Oh, yeah. So the, yeah, the conversation we want to have for the first time on the air as opposed to having an off-air conversation. So it's oh, quiet in the studio during commercial breaks. Well, I get that. When we did radio together, we didn't want to talk because anything that we talked about was fodder for the show. <laughs> it's true. Anything we said would go right on the air. Right. So... Yeah, so, I, yeah. I, I totally get that. Yeah, but John and I are, are are great. I mean, 30 years, he's the longest relationship I've had in my life. Um, and it's been very successful. Yeah. I don't want to f- brag, but uh, we are going into the Southern California Sports Broadcasters Hall of Fame uh, in January. So Whoa. we've done something, right? That's great. Yeah, we're going to be in the same place they put... Uh, you know, I, not that we're comparing ourselves at all, but like Chick Hearn is there, Vince Scully is there. I mean, what are we doing? There? But we we get to go in, which is cool. Do you get uh, a jacket, or do you get a, a mitt, or you get a gold? Or? You get a gold jacket, and no, I have no idea what you get. You get a I would mic, like a you get plaque. like a gold golden mic or something. You know, I would like a trophy. I'll be honest with you, I want a trophy. I've got a spot on the mantle ready for it. If you went into my house, you would see that there's a place where I do put all my awards, um, and they. There are a considerable number of them. Um, All right. So, Sue, what do you got going? So, you know, a while ago, I had asked you if um, if you've gotten fan mail. Yes. And um, you said that you really haven't gotten a lot of fan mail over the years, which kind of surprises me. You've been on the air a long time. And, you know, you know, we get we get Twitter and Instagram and we get like immediate messages. So fan mail mail kind of doesn't exist anymore. Right. So in the heyday of me doing stand up. Yes. I got a considerable amount of fan mail. Really? Yes. And so I was cleaning out my office the other day. Okay. And I stumbled upon a couple of letters that I had gotten. And um, I want to read some of the letter. Okay. And then I I actually have a, a picture of one of the guys. But oh, nice. I don't know if I can really show his face. Is that what do you think? Is that okay? What are the odds that somebody that sent you fan mail 25 years ago is going to be listening or watching, actually not even listening, watching the Culture Pop podcast. Well, true, true. You never know, but you just have to see it for what he looks like. And okay. I'll, all right. So this was um, in 1990. Yes. And he writes, hey, girl, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> I think you are gorgeous, sexy, and hot. In nice. capitals with two exclamation points. I would give anything. I mean Anything, if you would come to Kansas City so I can take you out to dinner. Let me tell you about myself. Oh, boy. I'm 20 years old. Okay. Six feet, two inches tall. Okay. Um, I'm about 195 pounds. Six two one ninety. Okay. 195. He's okay. I have brown hair. Okay. Shoulder, shoulder length. Oh. And light green eyes. Oh, nice. I attend DeVry University of Te- uh, Institute of Technology. Good school. Where I major in bu- uh, business operations management. Nice. I graduate in February 1993. Okay. This so, guy is like really into you. Oh, listen to this. This is a serious letter. <laughs> he wrote that? I want you to come here to go out with me. I realize you have a commitment with the comedy channel. I was doing short attention span theater at the yes, time. Yes, yes. So that's where the letter came. But perhaps you could fly down for a weekend. Like I would ever. <laughs> anyway, I doubt you will come here. You're right about that. Yes. But at least I tried. If you have time, write me back, okay? Love. Love. Paul. Oh, and then these are the little details that are so funny to me. Okay. P.S. I watch you on American Cable Vision Channel 18. Channel 18. He thought that was very important. To tell <laughs> yes, me. Significant. Yes. So I have to show you a picture of him. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. 62195. <laughs> okay. He actually looks like a matador. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Wow, that is look, quite a jacket. Look at that jacket. He's wearing. Doesn't he look like he, he looks does like a look like a matador or a Michael Jackson backup dancer? Okay. One of those things. Wow. Now, oh. did you ever respond to that guy? No, I did not. You know what that's called is taking your shot. He took his shot. Oh yeah. The same way Travis Kelsey took a shot with Taylor Swift. So he just randomly sent out a flare and Taylor Swift. Now, this guy could have been your Travis Kelsey. Not even close. <laughs> Not even close. Even if he played college football. Um, so I just have to read you one other one because it's so funny. So Alan Havy. Yes. Who's been comedy, on the show. Great guy. Comedian, actor on Billions. He was yeah. on Mad Men. Great, talented, funny, funny guy. Really, really good. So... He worked at the Comedy Channel the same time I did. He had yeah. his show. So he gave this to me. All yep. right. So it says, Mr. Havy, you're coming in loud and clear in Monroeville, Pennsylvania. Your show is the best thing that happened to late night TV. And then he says a bunch of other things. Then he says, um, could you please, I wish you could do me a favor. Mm -hmm. Could you please forward this picture of me to Sue Kalinsky? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, she's the sexiest thing I've seen since Ann Archer. Since Ann Archer. <laughs> That's Ooh. so random. What year was it? This was it's, 90. Let me see. It's probably like right yeah. after Fatal Attraction came out or something. Yep, Ann 91. Archer was big in that. She was hot. Yo, she but, was hot. Yeah, she was hot. But Ann Archer. I mean, yeah. come on. Yeah, you and Ann Archer. So he said there was a picture, but I don't know whether <laughs> Alan lost the picture. I, there's no picture. Of oh, that's very funny. Yeah, see, I I used to get stuff like that. Now people just fire off tweets or fire off yeah. messages on Instagram or whatever, and we we get those that way. But yeah, mail doesn't exist the way it used to. But I think I would have written a, a little note to them. Like we have a rule at our place that if you're getting married, um, send us an invitation. We will not come to the to the wedding, but either John or I will go to your registry and send you a gift. And we've been doing this for years and years. We've given hundreds of wedding gifts. So that's kind of the same. Like, they're sending out a flare. I'm inviting you to a wedding. And you're at least going to get us a gift. See? He, well, that's different. Shot. That's different. You okay. know? You, you know, you guys are getting invited to a wedding. They're, you know, and, and sending a gift. Absolutely. And I don't know whether they're fishing for a gift, you know. They are. They are. Yeah. So, but for something like this, um, you know. I mean, yeah, maybe I should have, you know, said thank you. Like one guy wrote me and said, I know, I know that you're, you're 30 something and single because he saw me at Caroline's and in my act, I said I was 30 something and single. It was during one of my many, uh, interim, you know, my breakups with Kenny where I right. break up for like a couple of months and then go back with him. So, um, yeah, but I, I never, but you would never date someone who came to one of your shows. That's not, that's not true. Oh, that's not true. You no, would never date I'll, anybody who saw you on TV, sent you a letter saying you were sexy. It's just that the, the vibe I was getting from these guys, a little that creepy. They, they were not my type. Yeah. A little creepy, a little yeah. creepy. Got it. Yeah. Well, Sue, you remain unbelievably sexy <laughs> after all the still sexy. I'm surprised that you don't still get these letters. <laughs> Actually, you know. <laughs> I get them here at the Culture Pop Podcast headquarters. I should send them over to you. Culture Pop Podcast headquarters. So much mail here at the the old <laughs> CPP This just in. Fan mail for Sue. Fan mail for Sue. So uh, we're going to introduce um, our guest today, who is actually, this is a great conversation. He is a movie producer. He's a studio executive. His movies include Dirty Dancing, Terminator 2, True Lies, and Best Picture Winner, Platoon. He's also the executive producer of Mortal Kombat Media, including three number one films, a TV series, and an animated series. And he's written a brand new book called A Touch of the Madness about his career and ideas that give everybody a chance to chase their dreams. Larry Kazanoff is here. Larry, thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. Glad to be here. So I love the book in part because I recognize the moments in my career that were guided by a touch of madness. I've had some. Um, I've chased some big projects, mixed results. Describe 
what a touch of madness is and what age did you first know that you had it? Um, so what? I, so I wrote the book because I noticed, I, I'm a movie producer and I noticed that in today's world, people not only in my business, but in every business are kind of scared to be their true uninhibited creative selves, really in a way I've never seen before. And I hope maybe some of my fun stories from the movie business would be good illustrations and motivation to do that. So a touch of the madness is that crazy mad idea in the back of your mind, that creative thing you always wanted to do, but you're not doing it. Maybe your parents, your kids, your spouse, someone doesn't like it. The one that you're, you're just crazy, that's the one to do. That's usually how great movies are made, how great anything is made. So that's what it is. And I, I think I had it <laughs> from day one, to tell you the truth. I didn't know what to call it. Um, and the way I learned uh, what to call it was I got very lucky out of college. I wanted to be a movie producer since I was a little kid. And I got very lucky. And then my first job out of school in the mid-80s was for an emerging independent studio called Vestron, which was riding the wave in the day of the home video boom. Like there's a streaming boom today, there was a home video boom then. So my job was to deliver as head of production 80 movies a year, eight zero. Make them, buy them, co-produce them. We don't care. If you lose money, you're fired. Don't lose money. So we made low budget horror movies and rom-coms and action movies, you know, high concept and sort of B-level star in every movie. And then we got the script for a movie called Platoon. And Platoon was not that kind of a movie at all. It was a really serious movie about the effects of the vietnam war on the kids who went but i wanted to make it and my boss said you're crazy that's not what we do we we have thought what that's not our point the people in it became stars but they weren't stars the director oliver stone had done a prior movie which we had actually financed but it wasn't successful i loved it but it wasn't successful and so um nevertheless he said but you're the head of production as i kept fighting and if you want to do it you can do it but there's always a but you have to bet your job hmm. so what do i do it I'm, I'm, you know, four months into this amazing job, but I thought, well, I didn't get in the movie business to play it straight and to take no chances. So I greenlit Platoon. When I saw the movie early one morning in a film festival, I'm the only person in history to giggle their way through Platoon. Not because it wasn't great, but because mm. I was like, oh my God, I'm getting fired. Oh, this is great. It was so great. It won Best Picture that year. And a few yep. months later, I ran into the director, uh, Oliver, at a bar in New York one night and he bought me a drink and he said, you know, kid, I always liked you. You have a touch of the madness. And I thought, touch of the madness? Is, is he calling me crazy? Am I a little crazy? And then I thought about it. I thought, well, my boss had a touch of the madness for letting a 25-year-old kid run an 80-picture film slate. All read a touch of the madness by insisting on making a Vietnam movie the way no one ever had. And I had a touch of the madness by betting my job on it. So right then and there, it crystallized to me that this is what, what I've been what I call it. This is what you need. And everything great, a great creative idea requires a chance. And it requires a touch of the madness. And the final thing is, why is that important? I mean, so maybe you never take a great idea. And that's okay if you want to stay in the middle. Because the current of the river of life will drag you to the middle. But your audience, whether you're in radio, podcasting, TV, stand-up comedy, whatever, it, it doesn't want that. The audience wants the, the new and the different. And to swim away from the new and the different, you need to touch the madness. You need a crazy idea to help you be creative and innovative. And that's it. And so I, it just crystallized for me the way I'd always been thinking. And ever since then, that's been my touchstone. That's what I think about. That's how I buy movies, art. That's how I cast people. That's how I make decisions. That's how I hire people. I always look in people's eyes and say, they have a touch of the madness. Hmm. So does everything have to just fall in place for your madness to work? I mean, you, <laughs> could, you could have a touch of the madness, but the players involved sometimes put up a barrier and don't buy your madness. I mean, is that... that, that that's, that's a great question because the touch of the madness, the first step, yes, is your idea. But, but it also means having a mad zeal with which to, to pursue the projects and never let it go. Because everyone, again, in that current of the river of life is going to tell you you're wrong and you have to hang on like crazy. So when, when, um, when early on in those days, you know, we did Dirty Dancing. And Dirty Dancing was a movie that another studio had, uh, had put in turnaround, meaning they started and stopped it. It wasn't going great. And the guys who ran the bone, my company recruited these two musical and producing geniuses named Jimmy Einer and Michael Lloyd to come in and supervise it. So then you know it's going to be different. And the first thing they did was got a hold of the song Time of My Life, which was not the song you hear today. It was a high falsetto disco song. And <laughs> Jimmy and Michael changed it. And they got Bill Medley from the Righteous Brothers and they made a different song. And they sent the new version out to, um, you know, the, the record company and the director of the movie and the management and everything. No one liked it. 
No one liked it at all. Everyone didn't like it. And they write back and say, you got to make these changes, do this, do that. Jimmy and Michael were so gracious. And they said, sure, no problem. We'll do all the changes. Three weeks later, they sent version two with a note saying, you know what? We actually sent this version to some radio stations. As you guys know, in those days, radio stations really helped you promote songs and albums. They seemed to like it. Everyone loved version two. Thank you for doing it. It's so wonderful. Thank you for, for being so great. And so the question is, what, what did they do between version one and version two that was so brilliant? What was the brilliant change they made? And here's what they changed. Nothing. They didn't change a thing. They just wrote version two on the label hmm. and they doubled down because they sent it to radio stations. And if they didn't like it, that's the public. They would have been screwed. They knew what they had and they believed in it. That's, that song won the Grammy for best song and it won the Academy Award for best song that year. So to answer your question, so that's what you got to do constantly, always, all the time, because it's always great to come on these shows and talk about, you know, the, the, the ones that work. But as you know, a million of them don't. And even the ones that do take forever. And, and so you've you got to hold on to your idea with your mad zeal. And then I, you got to ask, you got to ask, 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 ask. You got to ask anybody, anything in pursuit of your goals and never stop asking, no matter who it is. So, so when I know, talk to, oh, sorry, Larry. No, I was just going to say, you know, I like to ask people, so who's ever listening and watching, if you, if you could call one person today in the world, right now, who's alive, and ask them a question, who would you call and what would you ask? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, I, most what, people, what, what? You, you know what? It would be you. Yeah, yeah, you. Right now. <laughs> no, you know, when I talk to, to students about working in broadcasting, I always ask, you know, I always say, ask anybody for help, even if you think it's a long right, shot. Exactly. Make make the ask. And as a result, when people are trying to break into the business and they have the the nerve or the gumption or whatever that is to reach out directly to me, I always do whatever I can to help. Do, do you do the same thing? Yeah, I do. I mean, every now and then, for some reason or another, I don't if we look up the person and, you know, they're a serial killer. But in general, <laughs> I'm they're too mad. But, yeah, 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 but exactly. But in general, yeah, I mean, because you know, every time I I do one of these or I give a speech about about the book, now someone says, "Hey, you said to ask," and we get to ask, and I say, "Good for you, it's great," and I like it when people do that because you you have to, and you, and, and and most people don't know the answer to that question. Who would you call? Because it doesn't occur to them that they can't call, but you yeah. can call anybody. Oh, it's so easy. You can email, you can text, you can DM. There's so, so many ways to do it. But people are still, you know, very trepidatious to do that again, because I think it doesn't occur to them that they can and they can. Well, there's something empowering about reaching out to someone who you don't think is going to respond. And, you know, sometimes they don't. And you've <laughs> got to just roll, you know, let it roll off your back and say, okay, so, but I made the move. I made the move and I called somebody who I thought was, was not that I couldn't even get in touch with, you know? Yeah, um, and, and, you know, if they say no or they don't take your call, the sky doesn't fall in. You know, listen, I, 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 lots of people still don't take my calls so they don't, or they don't say yes to me. I mean, I'm astonished. Who wouldn't want to Who wouldn't want to talk to me? But the answer is apparently a lot of people. But you still got to do it. You still got to take the shot. Right. So, so when I was a kid growing up in Toledo, Ohio, I was the only one that subscribed to the trades. Um, I got uh, Variety and, and The Hollywood Reporter in uh, in Maumee, Ohio, just outside of Toledo. I was a weird kid. Uh, when I was about 17, I wanted to come to L.A. to pursue my dreams in the movie business. And I actually found Stephen Bochco's production company phone number <laughs> and called and asked for Stephen Bochco because he was working on a new show. And I asked him, can I come work for you? And he picked up the call. He was very nice to me, said, you know, get back to me after you finish school. But the fact that I was willing to do it was kind of the that w- that was the uh, the the barrier I think that was holding me back. But see, that's why you're successful because you did it. And so the question is, why don't more people do it today? And that's what we want to encourage people to do. Because you did it. You called Stephen Bochco and it gave you encouragement. But you had the you had the guts to call Stephen Bochco. So someone would you know would look at you as a kid and go, "Ah, oh, that kid's got a touch of the madness. He's going to make it because he's doing it." So what happens say- when the touch of the madness starts to wane, or does it? Uh, I don't think so. No, I, 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 I no, I, I don't. Uh, no, I mean, you mean wane in society or wane in me? Wane, like for example, with me, I'm less. I have less madness than I had when I was thirty. Let's say um, I have drifted towards the middle of the river of life a little bit, <laughs> um, and so your book made me 
kind of re-examine where I am and what I'm doing with my life. Well, you know, listen, I mean, if you're happy, then that's great. In, in my case, no, I'm getting more of it. <laughs> I seem to be living in reverse. I have more crazy ideas and I'm taking even more chances right, right now than I did when I was younger. Right. I you know, Steve and I were having a conversation uh, before we came on the air and um, he was talking about how, you know, he's, he should be writing more. And I said, should is such a dangerous word, <laughs> you know, because, word. and I said, you know, he says, well, I think that's what I should be doing now. And I said, well, maybe that's not what you should, should be doing now because you're not doing it. You know, um, maybe it'll come to you at a different time. Maybe this isn't the right time. Um, you know, I, I, someone told me a story and look, I wouldn't want to wait till I was 80 something years old to make my first documentary, but it, they had a friend who was like, I think she was in her early eighties and she made a documentary. She had never, ever done anything like that. And she was talking to them and they were probably like 30 years younger than her. And she said, ah, who's going to be interested in an 80 something year old woman doing a documentary? And they said, just do it. It's a great idea. Do it. And she did it and it got into film festivals. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, yeah, I mean, it ended up being a great story. So, you know, I think what happens a lot of times is people compare themselves to what other people are doing at this, at certain times when you're at maybe at, a, at the same age as somebody, you know, and oh, you say oh. the comparison thing is really uh, it's it's dangerous. I think the question is, is not should, is do you want to? I mean, we, I encourage people to have a touch of the madness if they want to. The amount of people who say to me, what I really want to do is, but I don't know, I can't. That's who we want to encourage. If not everybody has to, I mean, look, you can live a lovely life not doing this, but if you want to really excel, and especially if you're in any creative business whatsoever, even your product development, you have to do pursue the new and the different and, and you need innovation and there's and, and there's ways to do it. The other thing too is, you know, there's three steps to do. You create your idea, ask anybody. And the third thing is play. I think you gotta have fun. I think you gotta enjoy this. I mean, you gotta look at your staff and say, well, let's all go out for yogurt today. Let's do something crazy. Let's go bowling. Let's let's prank the, the other production company. I mean, why not? And if you yeah. play it like a game, so you don't take it seriously. But if you take it like a game, all of a sudden calling that Stephen Bochco isn't anxiety producing. It's well, okay. It's, this is my, you know, this is my uh, bat on this one, and the next one, someone else gets one. Make it fun. So you've done nineteen Mortal Kombat projects now in twenty years or so. Uh, huge like part that, yeah. of of your career and your legacy, unbelievably successful. At the time, video games weren't really used as IP for film. What what made you see a movie uh, in this video game, Mortal Kombat? I had made uh, Terminator 2 before that, and the Terminator 2 arcade games were the, and, and video, uh, were the most successful ever. And I, I stayed friendly with the company, and very soon thereafter, um, I was going to meet Chicago where they were, so I just said, oh, I'll come by and say hi. And they said, yeah, yeah, because we're testing a game that's rivaling, just testing it, rivaling Terminator for, for the record of best ever. I said, we can't have that. And I played it in the, in the, in the office of the chairman of the company. Which is in the kind of, I don't know, south side of Chicago or something in this kind of old warehouse. And I said, this is Star Wars meets Center of the Dragon. This is great. If you give me the rights to this, I promise you I'll produce it in every medium, movies, TV, stage, music. And the guy said, ah, piece of crap arcade game. <laughs> he didn't believe in it either. <laughs> but, but, um, to tell you the truth, everyone told me I was crazy, but I didn't think I was making a movie from a video game. I think I was making a movie from the story the video game was based on. And that's what I've always thought in my mind. So it's always to me the essence of the idea. And whether it, you know, when, when they used to think in the old F. Scott Fitzgerald, Sam Golden days, you can't make a movie from a book and you can't make a movie from a play. You can make a movie from anything if it's a good story. So it was the story, it wasn't the video game. And that's an important distinction, I think, in how you create your ideas to understand the essence of what the audience really likes. And the other thing that happened when I was deciding, it was a huge decision. Everyone told me I was crazy. I left this huge job to do it. Um, I was wandering around an arcade, which for people might not know is a place where they used to have games where you put in quarters to play them. Back in the and day, yeah. Back in the day, yeah. And so I was in Westwood in California and a little, I was by the Mortal Kombat game. It had just come out, the arcade game, and an 11 year old kid slapped a quarter down and looked up at me and said, I challenge you to Mortal Kombat. And then he <laughs> beat the hell out of me. I mean, the kid was great. He beat the hell out of me. And Mortal Kombat, if you don't know, makes you feel really good if you win. You win. Sub-Zero loses. Flawless victory. The kid left feeling great. He could beat an adult. 
And that's empowerment. And that's what I've always thought Mortal Kombat is really the essence of it is about. And then and there, I decided to do it. Yeah, I just, I want to go back real quick because in the beginning you were saying that, um, you think that people today or younger people today don't have everybody enough, or everybody. Okay. Everybody, um, doesn't take risks. Um, I look at a certain, um, majority of the population and maybe it is younger, younger people. And I think because you can do so much with social media, you know, you could put something on TikTok and think, you know, you know, something crazy and, you know, in like a couple of days, you could be a star just from one post. It's such a different world, you know, I, and I always hate to say, oh, when I was growing up, but like when I started my career as a stand up, my friends and I, we made videos and did like crazy stuff or, you know, we, we shot stuff. I wouldn't say that they were so much videos. We shot crazy stuff, but we had nowhere to go with them. We couldn't post stuff online. So, um, I would think today that that generation would be so much more of risk takers because there's such a there's there's such an avenue for them to um, to show themselves, right? No, I think about it, I think about this a lot, and I you would logically make that conclusion, but I think it's the opposite. Here's 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 a story that unfortunately just because of the publishing deadline didn't make it in the book, but I have a friend who's a model um, named Olivia, and uh, she's from Hungary, and during the pandemic she wound up in the hospital she had gone to mexico for a week she jumped off a roof she's crazy she's wild she landed on a cactus it went through her hand cactus poisonous it didn't get proper treatment where she was she wound up in the hospital and i didn't even know she was there until she'd been there for almost a week and then when i found out no you no one went went to see her because either they they were scared to go to the hospital during the pandemic or because, you know, her family and everyone, and she lives in Hungary. So I said, well, what do you need? And I spent the day, I went to her house, I got her stuff, I went shopping for her. And she's a fun person. In my other life, I'm a photographer and I shot her a lot. So as a joke, I stopped by Victoria's Secret and I bought some lingerie. Because I wanted to untap, okay, here's the milk you wanted, here's the fresh towels you wanted. Oh, and here's lingerie, ha, ha, ha. At the end of the day, it was she had a private room. Um, uh, visiting hours are over, but they didn't kick me out. And I said, do you need anything else? And she said, I said, one more thing I want to do. Mind you, she had a tube running through her hand. Wow. And she said, I want to take pictures in the laundry. I'm like, are you kidding me? And, and I didn't have a camera. It's on my iPhone. And she wanted to play. I mean, I thought it was so inspiring that, that, I mean, you could have been so depressed alone in a hospital, still in danger for six days. And she wanted to play. We took the pictures. They're great. She posted one. And with the story, she got more likes and more attention than any picture she'd ever posted, except her manager, her manager, the model the agency, they didn't like it because hmm. you know, how can you have fun in a hospital? Which I think, how, I mean, what a great motivational story. She took it down and she was miserable for a couple of months about it because hmm. it just wasn't her. It just wasn't her. And she was scared to do it because the pressure on social media is so crazy. Finally, one day, she just said, the hell with it. I'm sick of not being me. She posted a picture. Within three months, she had a new manager, a new modeling agency, and she got engaged. And her career took off. I can't say it's just because of the picture. It's because she finally said, I, I had to touch the madness. I'm going to do what I want. So people online, there's such pressure online because you uh, on, on uh, social media, if you do the wrong thing, you're bombarded with hate. And, you know, I think we come in, you know, when I first, a few years ago, found out about cyberbullying, I'm like, cyberbullying? People used to really try to beat me up. I mean, that sounds great. Woo. And they said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and explain to me that it's, you know, if you're now younger, it's a constant, constant pressure that never goes away. So I think, I think logically, so you're right. But I think practically speaking, that's not how it works. Right. Uh, you know, one of my personal heroes, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a uh, Vietnamese um, monk, the foremost voice in the mindfulness movement. How did you meet him and what is your mindfulness practice like? So um, I read a book. He's written over 100 books. I read a book he wrote. I really liked it. So I thought, what can I do with this incredibly peaceful Zen Buddhist monk? I thought I can use him as an inspiration for my ultra action packed <laughs> video game based movies, Mortal Kombat. <laughs> so I, I called him out to go meet him, same as we're talking about. He said, sure. I went to meet him after two hours being with him and some of the monks and sisters. I felt like I'd been on vacation. And I said, what's your secret? And he said, no secret practice. And I said, I could learn how to be this way. I have a lot of energy in those days. I was even more frantic. And long story short, we became good friends. They came to my house in LA and I, I had a bunch of studio executives over to, to meet them. Maybe we put mindfulness inside um, 
more of our movies. Uh, I became friends with him. Uh, I started practicing mindfulness. He asked me to do a documentary on mindfulness, which I did. And I showed it to him right before he, uh, he passed away. He, he died this year in, uh, in, in Thailand where he was recuperating from a stroke. And so what happens in my call for, you know, to put my peaceful Buddhist monk in Mortal Kombat, that didn't happen, but he became a, a lifelong friend. And yeah, because of them, I practice mindfulness every day now. And the best thing I can give you that he said is when Oprah started her network, I brought him to, to be the first person interviewed. And I sat next to him the whole time. He was a little trepidatious about doing it. But she said to him, what, how often a day do you meditate? And he said, everything I do, I do mindfully. So everything I do is a meditation. And that's how they live. I mean, I've, I've been with them so many times. You know, if you're walking in the woods and with them and you say, you know, I have a question. With the first few times you do it, and you keep walking, you realize you're alone because now they have a question, they're not going to walk anymore. They're going to mm -hmm. listen to your question. Or when they drink tea, they drink tea. And then they, they, right. they, they do a hundred, just one thing a day. We don't. We tend to, you know, write emails, make phone calls, do it all at once. And so that's really, really, really what they've taught me. And the documentary is called Mindfulness, Be Happy Now on Amazon. And it was wonderful making it. We got, you know, he's in it. A lot of his monks and sisters are in it. And now uh, we have uh, Deepak Chopra and, and Oliver Stone and, and um, a lot of great people in it but yeah so I, I do you practice mindfulness i do i do when i'm when i'm on my game i do some i i it's always there you know there's always you know walking when i walk in the morning that's one of the things i think about is you focus on walking and just walking um i always think of like uh people people say i can't meditate and then i i explain well do you remember the movie karate kid paint the fence that's meditation. Right. Uh, wipe the, I, I shine the car, meditation. It's like there's a meditation in everything. So I do try to find that every day in some activity. And then I do the actual kind of medica meditation, medication, listen to me. I do the actual kind of meditation where you sit down and, and you take 10 minutes and you just get still. You know, he used to say, one more deep breath you took today than yesterday is great. So even if once an hour or once a day, you take a deep breath. You know, they do this great thing in their monasteries where they just randomly, a few times an hour, a bell rings and everyone stops for 30 seconds. And the first time you do it, it's really weird because imagine if we just stopped for 30 seconds and we we're staring at each other. But when you get into it in their world, it's incredibly peaceful. And it's so simple when you think about it. You just stop every hour or so and just take a deep breath for 30 seconds. And that's it. That alone, he, he would say, is better than not doing it. Yeah. So, um, so are you not a multitasker because it's doing too many things at once? Does that get in the way of your mindfulness? I try very, very, very carefully not to be a multitasker. I do a lot during the day, but I try and do only one thing at a time. I mean, I've gotten to the point where if I'm in my office and I'm working email and someone comes in, I say, okay, just one minute. And then I, I finish and I'm making it sound like I'm really good at it. I'm not, but I, I'm conscious of it and I try and I'm way better than I used to be, but I still have a long way to go. Yeah, I think, I think at sometimes outside forces, like I'm, I'm not working, um, you know, physically working at, um, an office right now, but I produce TV. And so I worked in, in post. And because of the nature of how the business has changed in a lot, with a lot of production companies, it really interferes with being mindful. <laughs> you know, it's because, <laughs> because the, the, um, the deadlines are unmanageable. And as a producer, I would have to sit in front of my computer, have an avid on my desk, a, a, a editing facility on my desk, and then, um, and eat lunch because I couldn't take lunch. I had to do everything. And that was so damaging. I mean, now that I'm, I'm not there anymore, you know, um, it, it's so liberating, but that's kind of the nature of how the jobs that I was I was doing, that's how they do these jobs today. You know, how do you, how do you funny, combat that? That's a tough one. Lunch is a tough one. The, the funny thing is, though, if you if you enjoy it and you do a little less, you can often get more done. We were shooting one of the Mortal Kombat movies in, uh, in southern Thailand. It's a beautiful area called Krabi and the islands. It's gorgeous. And we needed B-roll of the islands and the water. B-roll is just um, for people watching. It's just uh, uh, establishing footage without any actors in it. But the only boat that was stable enough for crew, because the boats we were using were little teak fishermen's long boats, you know, like small little up, uh, boats where we were, was 
of the yacht at the Amman Hotel, which is this gorgeous hotel not far away. So I decided, I, of course, am going to supervise the B-Roll crew. And we spent three days cruising around, you know, the islands of southern Thailand on the Amman yacht. Now, you could say, oh, what a boondoggle, what a, what a crew, what a... No, no, it was in the budget. It's exactly what we needed to do. It, it, we, it came out great. It was a good plan, actually, because it was resourceful to find it. But there's a little party going, I can't do this. I can't, I can't have this much fun. But you know what? Why not? And the fact yeah. that we had so much fun made the crew feel better. So sometimes I think the answer is if you go in during those times, and I find this hard to do too, and you go take a half an hour for lunch, that, that you actually get more done later in the day because you'll focus on it more. Because when you multitask, you actually aren't completing anything. You know what I do sometimes? I don't want to reveal what it is. I found this little charming tea shop not too far from where I work. And I didn't even know it existed. And I have a great dog. And sometimes I just go there by myself for 20 minutes and I just do nothing but sit there with my dog and have tea. And then I go back to work. Hmm. And it's when I do that, I have a better day. But there's a party saying, I can't do this. I can't possibly. Yes, you can. Yeah. And he yeah. does. Yeah. Well, listen, Larry, this, is, this has been great. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about the book, um, and I strongly recommend it, A Touch of Madness, is that it put, put me in a very self reflective mood. I, I thought about my past decisions. I thought about what I'm going to do from here. It was really, really valuable. I think no matter what you're doing, whether you're working in show business or you're working, you know, in, in whatever walk of life, you have a small business. I think there's a lot to be learned from this book. So congratulations on it. Thank you so much. And I thank you for the nice words. All right. Thank you so much, Larry. Take care, guys. And there is Larry Kazanoff, and the book is called A Touch of the Madness. You know, and read the book over the weekend, and I got a little self-reflective. I actually told Larry that. I'm like, I don't know if I still have a touch of the madness. Like, did the touch of the madness go away, or is it still here? Well, I mean, do you think that at certain times in your career, your madness was stronger because you weren't where you are today? Yes. You know? Yes. Yes. Like, I feel like, and, you know, this this is psychotherapy. I feel like I've plateaued. Like, this is where I'm going to get to. <laughs> Does that make sense? I'm going to be the host of Mason in Ireland and the host of the Culture Pop podcast, and that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Well, you're getting a, you're going to get into the uh, Hall of Fame, too. Getting into the Hall of Fame, exactly. But when they start doing that, you start thinking, oh, I'm in the Hall of Fame. Like, maybe that's, is that, is it over now? Well, you know, I, I never say that it's over because I mean, I'm, I'm in my mid sixties and I'm still trying to sell shows. Right. And you I'm, still are, you know, and, and, you know, you just, you just don't know. So right. I'm not trying, I'm trying to not, um, you know, get too like freaked out about like I'm not working and, you right. know, and, but I am working. I'm just not working for a paycheck. Right. So right. I'm just, you know, I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, who knows? Who knows? You know, I mean, you're, you're like, you're old, for me and especially in my business. And, and maybe for you, it's, it could be the same thing. You're like, you're like a, a, an email or phone call away from getting something really amazing. Yeah. That's true. That's true. You know, I'll tell you a great touch of the madness story. So I really had it. I had a terrible case of touch of the madness, or maybe it was a really good case of a touch of the madness. So when I came out in 90, no, 2000, no, 92, I came out in 92, um, came out. Um, and I immediately did the natural thing, which was to write a, an autobiographical screenplay. It's the hackiest, most cliched thing in the world. Uh, but it was about my coming out. It was called Growing Up Late. And if I went back and read it today, it was awful by today's, today's standards. Like I, I, at the time, I thought it was great. I, I think it's probably a terrible script. But I had this idea. So you got to attach people to a project. And there was a role in it. I had just gotten back from the Olympics. There was a role in it that I thought Greg Luganis could play. And I could get like a little pop out of it, right? So you attach somebody and you attach somebody else. So I found out where Greg Luganis lived um, through a legitimate source. And I sent him the script and he agreed to do the part. Now the script never went anywhere, but the fact is Greg Luganis had committed 
to co-star in Growing Up Late. And that's the kind of stuff I used to do all the time. When I opened Cinema's Palm Door, people said, you're crazy. It turned out great. Um, so, you know, Touch of the Madness is a good thing. I'm a little less mad than I used to be. But that's you never okay. know. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I yeah. mean, you know, you know, I don't know what's really uh, come up or what you want to do. Well, I expect you know, after, CBS after. to call me about the uh, 1230 slot. Uh-huh. The James Corden slot. Well, that'd be ideal. That's a stretch. Well, goal. well you know, you know, what's kind of crazy what? because of um, the Golden Bachelor. Yes. Um, there, I think, is going to be a door open to a lot of people of a certain age. Really? Yes, I do. Like my girlfriend, Carol Montgomery, who came on the show yes, and talked about yes. women of a certain age. She's got some campaign going on now with Julia Scotty, who I don't, do you know. Who oh, Julia yeah, I know Julia right? Scotty. Yeah. She has some campaign that she has on Facebook now to, uh, to get people to vote for Julia Scotty to be the new host of The Daily Show. Oh, right? wow. Yeah. I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but I do think that, that you're going to see a lot more of that. Because of the success of The Golden Bachelor. Oh, that's nice. Is The Golden Bachelor a success? Yes. It's yes. big? Yes, it's huge. Do you think younger people are watching it? Or is yeah, it? Yeah. I think, I think anybody who watched The Bachelor is, is watching, watching it, it and then some, you know? Yeah, I'm happy for that guy. What? He's like 60, 70? No, he's, two years 70, old? he's 72, I think. 72, and all the women are like in their 60s, I think. Yes. Yeah. I thought it'd be more interesting if they were, they still use the same age. Of the women from the right. Oh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, then it would be creepy bachelor. Creepy I bachelor, exactly. Um, all right, well, there you have it. And a little soul searching there in that show. I don't know what it adds up to, but I'm searching my soul. Uh, don't forget, uh, we've got really cool Culture Pop podcast merch. I still have this. I, the hoodie is right there. The Sue Kalinsky hoodie is right there. I don't know. I got to ship it to you or see you in person or something like that. Well, I don't um, know which way to go. I can't lose weight. I can't gain weight. I yeah. don't know what size it is. But uh, it's medium. It's a medium. I think you look like a medium to me. A medium men's? I guess it is a medium men's, yeah. Oh, it's, I'll be swimming in it. But oh, will you? Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. I'll give uh, it to Tom. Regardless, we've got really cool Culture Pop podcast t-shirts, and here's how you get them. Uh, you, uh, if you're watching the show, if you're listening to the show, we appreciate you. Um, the one thing that help us, helps us in the, uh, the so-called algorithm is when you give us a five-star review on uh, Apple or when you write a comment on Spotify, Apple, or on YouTube. It drives our numbers up on the uh, algorithm. So if you do that, and send us an email, maceandsue at gmail.com. We will try to get a uh, Mason, a, a, a Culture Pop podcast t-shirt out. By the way, you can also DM me. If you're listening to the show, watching the show, you can DM me at Venice Mace, and I will try to get, that's a little bit easier than using the, uh, the email address. Um, we appreciate you being out there. Thanks. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. Uh, subscribe on Apple, Spotify. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. And we will see you next time on the Culture Pop Podcast. Mm-hmm.